This is chapter 15. We're going to cover injuries to muscles and bones. In this, we're going to look at orthopedic traumas and how to manage them in a out ho outside hospital setting. Uh, we're going to focus on open fractures, closed fractures, dislocation, and amputations. We're going to also look at head, facial, neck, and spine traumas. We're going to go over how to recognize and manage life-threatening injuries. The EMR will encounter many types of musculoskeletal injuries. So this is where this chapter comes in in your training. Understanding the basic anatomy and function of the mus musculoskeletal system will definitely help you know how to treat these injuries. Keep in mind always as an EMR, first responder, scene size up, primary assessment, history taking, secondary assessment, and uh, reassessment algorithm. So let's start. The skeletal system consists of about 206 bones. It acts as a supporting framework for the body. Some of the functions are it supports the body, protects vital structures, assists in body movement, and manufactures red blood cells. They are broken into seven areas. There's a picture in the next slide. Okay. We have the, uh, the head, the spinal column, shoulder girdle, you have your rib cage, pelvis, the upper extremity, uh, and lower extremities. The bones of the head include the skull and the lower jawbone. The skull is actually made of many bones, fused together to form a hollow sphere that contains and protects the brain. The jawbone is movable bone attached to the skull. You know how we say that there is a 206 bones in an adult body? There are more bones in infant, in pediatric body because of the bones have not been fused yet. Okay, let's continue. The spine consists of, out of a series of separate bones called vertebrae. We have the uh, cervical spine, thoracic vertebrae, lumbar, sacrum, and the coccyx. Each shoulder girdle supports an arm. The shoulder girdle consists of, you can see in this picture, we have the clavicle, the scapula in the back, as well as the, the head of the humerus, which is the upper arm bone. Okay. And the upper extremities consists of three major bones plus the wrist and the hand. Let's look at the chest. There are 12 sets of ribs that protect the heart, lung, liver, and spleen. All of, all of the ribs are attached to the spine posteriorly. And the sternum is located in front of the chest, right here. The pelvis links the body and the lower extremities together. The lower extremity consists of the thigh, and the leg. The thigh, the bone there is a femur, and the leg is a tibia and fibula. And then you have your ankle and your foot. The muscle of the body prov uh, provides support and, mo and movement. Muscles are attached to bones by tendons and cause movements by alternating, contact contacting and relaxing, contracting and relaxing. 
Movement occurs at joints where two bones come together. The bones are held together by ligaments. So make sure that we understand the difference between tendon and ligaments, okay? There are three types of muscle groups. We have the cardiac muscles, we have the skeletal muscle, and we have the smooth muscle. Skeletal muscles is what we have control of, meaning voluntarily volu voluntary muscles and invol involuntarily muscles are the cardiac and the smooth muscles. Okay. So let's discuss the mechanism of injuries. You can either have direct force, indirect, or twisting force. You see this picture here in the MVA. Uh, the knee here takes a direct force against a, an object and the force travels through the femur and you have you can have a, a fracture of your pelvis through the indirect force a twisting force as you can see here this person has not landed or hit anything just a sh the sheer force of the twist uh, cause a fracture of the bone Description of the, there are many ways to describe a patient's injury. All right, use your sense of sight and touch, listen to the information the patient is giving you, and the most important part of your job is to provide the best assessment and treatment as an EMR. So we know what fractures are. It's a broken bone. A closed fracture is a bone that is broken, but there's no skin break. An open fracture is there's a bone, the bone is broken, but there, the, the, the skin is cut, is lacerated. A dislocation is, um, there's no fracture of the bone, but the attachment where the bone was is has been disrupted. All right. The bones end separate completely from the other end and can lock in one position. Along with the fracture and dislocation, these are very painful. Sprain and strains. A sprain is a joint injury caused by excessive stretching of the supporting ligament. A strain is a caused by stretching of tearing of a muscle. Okay. So signs of symptoms. Obviously pain. Look for open wound. Look for swelling. Look for a change in color. Uh, look for an ability to, to move the extremity or to put weight on it. Look for deformities or angulations and um, palpate for tenderness at the injury site. Assume, the tra assume that trauma patients have open wound that poses a threat of infection. So always wear a glove, you know, uh, universal precaution protecting you. When you respond to a motor vehicle crash, wear heavy re rescue gloves. The patient has active bleeding that may splatter. You should have protection for your eyes. If the patient does, then you, you need to protect your eyes, nose, and mouth. So general patient assessment. All the steps of the patient assessment process must be carried out before focusing on an injury limb. Limb injuries are not life-threatening unless there is excessive bleeding. Stabilize the patient's ABCs first, right? Now you're able to examine. After all this is done, now you're able to examine the injured limb. Inspect the injury. Compare it to the opposite limb. When you examine the limb, you may find any of the following. Look for any open wound. Look for deformities. Look for swelling. Look for bruising. Uh, assess for tenderness. Start on the top of each limb and use both hands to squeeze the entire limb in a systemic, firm manner. As you conduct the hands-on examination, ask the patient where it hurts the most. The location of the greatest pain is probably the injury site. If the patient shows no significant injury, ask the patient to move the limb carefully. Evaluate for circulation, sensation, and movement. Any injury may have associated blood vessels or nerve damage. So check for a pulse. 
Uh, check for sensory if the patient is able to feel your touch. Okay. All limb injuries are treated in the same way in the field. Okay. Cover open wound with dry sterile dressing. Apply firm but gentle pressure to control bleeding. Apply a cold pack uh, to painful, swollen, or deformed extremities. Splint the injury injured limb. Let's talk about some uh, splinting. So why do we splint? It prevents the movement of broken bone, broken ends, and dislocated joint or damaged soft and damaged soft tissue. Helps control bleeding, decreases the risk of additional damage, prevents close close fractures from becoming open fractures during the movement or transport. Now is remove the clothing from the injury limb to inspect the open wound, deformity, swelling, bruising, and capillary refill. Right? Note and record the pulse. Capillary refill, sensation, and movement distal to the point of injury. All these needs to be documented what you find or what you don't find. Cover all open wound with a dry sterile dressing before applying the splint. Do not move the patient before splinting unless there is an immediate da danger. Immobilize the joint above and the joint below the injury site. Pad all rigid splints. Support the injury site and minimize movement of the limb until splinting is complete. Splint the limb without moving it unnecessarily. When in doubt, splint. Now we're going to look at a few materials that they use for splinting. We have uh, rigid splints. These are these are the they're firm and um, usually apply to the front or back of the, of the injury extremity. All right, we have a uh, soft splints. The most common use of soft splints are vacuum splints or inflatable clear plastic air splint, like uh, this picture here next in this slide. You put it on, and then you it will be inflated. Air splints are constructed of, of a clear, flexible plastic, plastic material. We have tra traction splint. A traction splint holds a lower extremity fracture in alignment by applying a constant, steady pull on the extremity. Shoulder girdle injuries. Apply a sling made of a triangular bandage and secure it to the patient's body with, with, uh, with swatches. So these are uh, example of triangular bandages, let's say for a broken arm or a dislocated shoulder. For shoulder dislocation, place a pillow or roll blanket in the space between the upper arm and the chest wall. Apply the sling uh, or swath as far other sh as for other shoulder injuries. Elbow injuries do not move an in injured elbow from the position in which you find it. Wrap the elbow in a pillow, add padding, and secure the pillow. Transport the patient in a sitting position with the splint elbow resting on their lap. Forearm, forearm injuries. There's a few materials that may be used, air splint, cardboard splint, SAM splint, roll up newspaper or magazine, and uh, tape it up. There are several skills uh, that we're going to go over as we meet in the classroom. So how do we manage hand, wrist, and finger injury? Use a bulky hand dressing or a short splint. You can place any amputated parts in a sealed plastic bag and send it to the hospital. Cover all wounds with dry sterile dressing. Place the hand in a position of function. Place soft roller, roller dressing into the palm. Apply a splint and secure it with a soft roller bending. Pelvic fractures. Treat the patient for shock, but do not raise the leg until the patient is on the backboard. Feel for tenderness when you see both hands, when you use both hands to firmly compress the patient's pelvis. 
So you can see their hands there over the um, over the pelvis, interior of the pelvis, and uh, you would push down to see if the if the pelvis stable is the pelvis stable or not. For hip fractures, uh, for hip injuries, uh, dislocation and fractures are common. Both results may may be resulted from high energy trauma. Fractures occur in an elderly person because the bone weakens and becomes more fragile with, the, with age. Immobilize the hip in a position found. Use several pillows and rolls, blankets, place the patient on a long backboard, and transfer. For thigh injuries, a fracture of femur is very unstable. Place the patient in a comfortable position, treat for shock, and call for additional personnel and equipment. Traction splints are the most effective way to split a unilateral fracture of femur. Again, we will do hands-on doing our skill. Period. This is an example of um, the traction that we're talking about for the unilateral uh, injury of the leg. This is an example of uh, immobilizing uh, the knee with a splint band-aid on uh, the medial and lateral part of the leg. And how you see how they do it above and below the joint itself. Now, if the knee injury, if there's significant deformity, uh, place pillows, blankets, or clothing beneath the knee. Secure the splint material to the leg with bandage, swaths, or cravats. For the ankle and the foot, fractures can be splinted with either a pillow or air splint. So as an EMR, knowing what you can use that's around, definitely will be beneficial. You know, you can find a stick, wood, uh, metal, uh, clothing rolled up. Definitely all these can be used uh, to stabilize uh, any musculoskeletal injuries. It takes two people to splint most limb injuries. One to stabilize and support the extremity, one person to apply the splint. Okay. Now, uh, for head and spinal cord injury are a common cause of death. Uh, can also lead to ir irreversible para para um, paralysis and permanent brain damage. The human skull has two primary parts, the cranium and the facial bones. Here we have a picture of the, uh, the bone, the different uh, bones. Uh, that makes the whole cranium and uh, in adults it fuses but in children uh, it's, it's it's not fused yet okay and we have the uh, we have the face bone we have the excuse me the jaw bone that they were discussing the uh, slides a few slides previously uh, this is the um, Sagittal view of the the brain, um, the spinal cord running through the spine, right there. Between the skull and the brain, we have the uh, uh, and uh, CSF cushions the brain. A direct force can injure the skull and the brain. A indirect force can also cause injuries. In a closed head injury, bleeding and swelling within the skull may increase pressure on the brain, leading to brain damage or death. An open head injury usually bleeds profusely because the um, is very vascularized. Examine the nose, eyes, and wound itself to see make sure that there there is uh, there is no any blood or CSF uh, leaking through. An example of um, a uh, head trauma, uh, you can see how when your neck is either, in this case, 
hyperextended. Uh, you can see that the brain does shake you can sustain trauma internally from a, uh, a flexion extension uh, injury now how it can hit posteriorly um, <clears throat> in the posterior part of the brain or sometime in the front as well as you can see how the neck is uh, is uh, ex is extended and ligaments and bones can get stretched, twisted, fractured, etc. So symptoms of head, head injury, you have confusion, unusual behavior, unconsciousness, nausea, vomiting, blood from the ear, decreases, decreasing consciousness, unequal pupils. Uh, paralysis can happen, uh, seizures, external head trauma, bleeding, bumps, and bruises. Serious head injury may produce raccoon eyes or battle signs. This is where we worry about some uh, basilar skull fracture. This is an example of a raccoon eye just bleeding underneath the um, uh, tissue. Um, this is a battle sign bleeding behind the ear. Uh, those are evidence of um, some basilar skull injury. Now, as the EMR, what should you do? Immobilize the head in a neutral position. Uh, if you must open an airway, use a jaw thrust maneuver. Um, your ABCs always comes into play. Determine whether blood is whether blood or CFF is seeping through the wound from the nose or the ears. Uh, control bleeding from all wounds with dry, sterile dressing and pressure. And always arrange for transport. Facial injuries are common results from following type of injuries. Uh, you have MVAs, assaults or falls. Airway obstruction is a primary danger in severe facial injury. Treatment for facial injuries like immobilizing the head in case of a jaw for trauma, uh, jaw thrust maneuver. Support the breathing your ABCs, control bleeding, and transport. Um, C-spine, immobilization with a C-collar, multiple EMR, first responders to move and transport patients. This is an example of log roll, how they keep the spine neutral as possible. This is mechanism of lack of incident. A displaced vertebrae swelling or bleeding may put pressure on the spinal cord and damage it. In severe cases, the spinal cord may be severed, as you can see here. A vertebral fracture can cause damage to the um, spinal cord. Injury to the spinal cord, high in the neck, paralyzes the diaphragm and results in death. Gunshot wounds to the chest or abdomen may produce spinal cord injury at that level. Falls, motor vehicle crashes, stabbings are other common um, <clears throat> mechanism of um, incident. Suspect a spinal injury if the patient has sustained high energy trauma. What are you looking for are laceration, bruises, tenderness, um, uh, neurovascular changes in terms of weakness, numbness, paralysis, loss of bowel or bladder control, also is something you would have. You can you can ask your patient who sustained a spinal type of uh, trauma. Um, <clears throat> so remember, scene size up, your ABCs, your primary assessment, your secondary assessment, stabilizing the neck and transport are 
what we need as an EMR for uh, when you're dealing with spinal injuries. Helmets. Helmets often do not need to be removed. Remove part of remove part or all of the helmet only under following two circumstances. When the face mask or visor interferes with adequate ventilation or with your ability or with your ability to restore an adequate airway. When the helmet is so loose that securing it to the spinal immobilization device will not provide adequate immobilization of the head. Chest injury. Fractures of, fractures of ribs. Even a simple fracture produces pain at the site of difficult, and difficulty breathing. Rib fractures may be associated with injury to the underlying organs. Um, you have the heart, lungs, um, liver, spleen. Determine whether a rib is bruised or broken. Apply some pressure toward, to another part of the rib. Be alert for signs and symptoms of internal injury, particular shock. Um, patients have increased difficulty breathing. Place a, the pillow against the injury injured rib to the splint to splint them. Prevent excessive movement of the patient. Administer oxygen if needed. So a flare chest <coughs> is when we have more than three three or higher uh, ribs broken on the uh, same side. A flare chest decreases the amount of oxygen and carbon dioxide exchange in the lungs. Do not restrict movement of the chest if patients are having difficulty breathing. It may be helpful to support the patient's breathing with a positive pressure uh, using a bag, bag valve mask or supplemental oxygen. Monitor, monitor and support the patient's ABCs. Arrange for prompt transport. Penetrating um, <coughs> chest injury. If an object that penetrates the chest wall, air and blood escapes into the space between the lung and the chest. The air and blood may cause the lung to collapse. As you can see, a uh, normal lung that's fully inflated, uh, collapsed lung, you know, due to an injury on the outside chest wall and <coughs> causing internal issues, you know, where blood or increasing air uh, starts, uh, collapses the lung. Blood loss into the chest cavity can produce a shock. Quickly seal an open chest with a uh, pressure dressing. Give them oxygen. If there's a knife or impaled in the chest, do not remove it. Arrange for trans uh, arrange for transport. <clears throat> to summarize, musculoskeletal injuries are caused by either direct force, indirect force, or twisting force. Fractures can be closed or open. That depends if there's a laceration, right? If there's an open, if it's an open fracture, there's a, there's under the under the fracture, there is a cut there. Sometimes you can have a bone sticking through it. A dislocation is a disruption of that tears the supporting ligament of the joint. A sprain is an is a joint injury caused by excessive stretching of the supporting ligaments. The three basic type of splints are we have rigid, soft, or traction. In a closed head injury, bleeding and swelling within the skull may increase the pressure on the brain leading to irreversible brain damage. An open injury of the head usually bleeds profusely because of the uh, <coughs> the amount of blood vessel that's in the um, that's in the area. Air obstruction in, is a primary danger in severe facial injuries. When you suspect a spinal injury, do not move the patient during the examination. The most common chest injury are rib fractures, flare chest, and penetrating wounds. In flare chest, definition is three or more ribs broken in the same side. So some review questions. The musculoskeletal system refers to musculoskeletal, right? C, bones and voluntarily, mu voluntarily muscle of the body. When examining an injured extremity, you should, sure, you should be sure to. Remember how they said, 
uh, squeeze the entire limb starting from the top into the, into a from top to bottom in a, system, a systematic firm manner. And last question. Facial injuries should be identified and treated as soon as possible because, what well, remember, um, facial injuries, you gotta think about preventing or managing or not recognizing airway problems, so D. So this ends this chapter, thank you very much.